And so it wasn't that God decided, let's see how much a man can take in Job's life. No, Job was afraid and kept speaking the fear. And then what he had moved from God's hands where there was blessing into the devil's hands where everything got torn up. In fact, the devil complained that he couldn't get to Job because God has put a hedge of protection around him. And God puts a hedge of protection around you and the only way it is broken is you have fear and you speak it and you speak it continually. So then what he had was in the devil's hands. And then after that, his body was in devil, the devil's hands. And so God didn't wanna see his man hurt so bad, so he sent an anointed preacher named Elihu and finally he came on the scene himself. So one last scripture from last week and then we'll move forward. Let's go to the first one. Job chapter three, verse 25 and 26. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. That was losing his kids, his possessions and so forth. He greatly feared it. It wasn't just he was kind of concerned. He greatly feared. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. That was the boils. Verse 26, I was not in safety, neither had I rest. So he was worrying. He couldn't sleep. He thought about it, was afraid continually. Neither was I quiet. And then he kept speaking it continually. And then the trouble came as a result of that. Praise the Lord. Remember, we talked about how Job said a lot of things that were not true. It was true he said them because uh, not all scripture lines up with the word of God. And what I mean by that is the devil talks in scripture. How about the things Jezebel said, so forth. They were, the writer was inspired to write the truth, but the action or words that someone speak do not necessarily, they were not inspired of God to do so. And so Job said a lot of talking out of ignorance because he didn't know God and he was not inspired of God to do so. So we don't want that to be our teacher. But brother David, you say, it's in the Bible. Well, the devil speaks in the Bible and he's not my teacher. Amen. He shouldn't be your teacher. So we're going to identify some things that Job spoke that were not true that we're not inspired of God to say that, do not line up with the scriptures because scripture should not be subject to private interpretation. Scripture interprets scripture. So we'll start with this one. Job was speaking and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. Well, that ought to tell you something right there. He doesn't have it together. If he thinks he's gonna return into his mother's womb, uh, he's got his head on backwards. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. So don't go with his conclusion when you see already, blessed be the name of the Lord. That tells us a whole lot right there about the book of Job. He spoke words out of ignorance. Then he became bitter because he thought God was doing it. When all along he gave open door, a hedge was broken by him for the devil. Remember the curse causeless shall not come. Then he finally got self-righteous because he was gonna keep his righteousness and God didn't have his because he was treating him unfairly. And so uh, put that back up there. So um, he, you know, he had a sweet attitude though. He still tried to have a sweet attitude. He didn't, you know, the Bible said he didn't sin because at this point in time, he still had a heart and he just, he was just ignorant of the things of God. He didn't know God was good all the time, praise the Lord. He didn't know, he didn't have First John 1, 5 to look at and says, uh, this is the message we preach. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. People say this and make a, a, a teaching out of it. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Like he's gonna give you something and take it away from you. And then we have a, a mom who just, you know, had a, a child that died crib death. And the preacher stands up and says, oh, the Lord taketh, giveth and the Lord taketh away. Well, how's that mom ever gonna really love Jesus after that? Uh, but, you know, that, his words are out of ignorance. Just repeating what he was taught 
in cemetery, I mean seminary. But the Holy Ghost is the best teacher. Yeah, the Lord, yeah, in this sense, he gives and takes away. He'll take away your sorrow and he'll give you joy. He'll take away your sickness, he'll give you healing. He takes away your sin and gives you righteousness, praise the Lord. But he doesn't give you good things and then take them away. Uh, Job's thinking was all messed up. He thought he could go back in his mother's womb, but he still blessed the Lord. I mean, he started out with the heart sweet, but if you keep thinking that God's doing these things, you're not gonna be able to keep that sweet attitude. That's why the devil has infiltrated even into the seminaries and so forth is to get bad teaching in so that people can't just honor God, trust God, because he wants to see the hedge is broken so he can kill, steal, and destroy. Let's go to the next. If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened unto my voice. 17. For he breaketh me with a tempest and multiply my wounds without a cause. Job is saying God is doing all these bad things to him and he doesn't deserve it. His righteousness is better than God's. Remember what we read, Proverbs 26, 2. The curse causeless shall not come. But Job is saying, oh, it was without a cause. And next verse. He will not suffer or allow me to take my breath, but fill it me with bitterness. Now, do you think God is filling his children with bitterness? Or is that the devil? So we don't want to let that be our theology and accuse God of what the devil is doing. Do you want your children to be bitter towards you? No. And we're, we got this flesh and we can do that. How much more does God want constant fellowship with us let's go to the next he says thine hands have made me and fashioned me together around it yet thou dost destroy me so what does the bible says who comes to kill steal and destroy the thief referring to the devil jesus said i've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly you see here these words do not line up with the word of god we don't want our theology based on that let's wait till he gets everything together and thinking right in chapter 42 praise the lord before we start receiving that let's go to the next which we just said the thief the devil comes not but for to steal kill he's the one that wants to destroy i've come that they might have have life and have it more abundantly here's one often repeat they put it in songs they sing it, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. And they cry and say, did we have church? Yeah, I had church, all right, church for the devil. This is not, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Who is going to destroy and slay? The enemy. But I will maintain mine own ways. I'm keeping my integrity and my righteousness. It's God who is unrighteous and mistreating me and without cause doing things that I don't deserve. You know what? You know what we deserve, don't you? If we got what we deserve in the next moment, a bolt of lightning would hit me and I'd be toast. And the same for you. Thank God we don't get what we deserve. Hallelujah. We can have the grace of God. Okay, let's go to the next. Job 13, 23 through 26. How many wrongs and sins have I committed? Show me my offense and my sin. Do you think God wants to show you your sin? Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? Please, is this the guy we want to learn from? Will you torment a windblown leaf? Will you chase after dry chaff? Verse 26. For you write down bitter things against me and make me reap the sins of my youth. Do you think God is keeping records of your wrong? What does the Bible say? He's blotting out the handwriting against us. Praise the Lord. It reminds me, we've had, uh, when we had a school, we, it was called Possibility School, and then we had, we were the landlord over at Tascacita Christian Academy, and I went to all the graduations, I think like 25 years or more. And each time the children would come up and they'd do certain things, sing songs or whatnot. 
And if you were going strictly by performance, this would be like the worst performance ever, you know, uh, every single time. But what were the parents doing? Were they booing and throwing banana peels and tomato? No, they were, you look over there, they had the big grins on their face and they just loving it. They had their video cameras and just enjoying it so much, praise the Lord. They weren't there trying to find mistakes, praise the Lord. Reminded me, I was watching uh, Joel Osteen the other day and he was relaying a sto uh, relating a story that his dad told him uh, that he went to a high school football game <clears throat> with one of his uh, congregate friends to see his son play. His son played defense and he never really touched the ball. And, but he was on the punt return team, you know, up front and the punt was real short. And this guy's son came up, he, normally he doesn't, you know, uh, run with the ball or anything like that. He came up and caught the punt. And he said that he took one step this way, one step that way, and then was clobbered by about eight or 10 guys. And he didn't move one inch forward. And uh, Pastor Osteen <clears throat> said that he was kind of embarrassed. He didn't want to look at the guy, you know, but his friend hits him on the arm, says, Pastor, Pastor. He goes, what? Did you see those two good moves? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So you see, God is not looking for your mistakes. You're thinking, oh, I didn't do this. I didn't complete it. I didn't do this right. I messed up. I made all these mistakes. No, God's not looking at that. He's saying, I saw those two good moves, praise the Lord. He's not looking for things to keep track of your wrongs. Hallelujah. Let's go to the next. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. God's not there to condemn you and put you wrong. No, you are already in condemnation. And Jesus came to get you out of that. But that the world through him might be saved hallelujah next one colossians 2 14. here you go he's not writing them down he's blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way praise the lord nailing it to the cross praise god He's just looking at your two good moves. If that's all the good moves you got, that's what he's looking at. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Next one, Job 19, 21. Here's Job. Have pity upon me. Have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. He's referring to his boils. I guess. If the hand of God is touching you, there's nothing but blessing there. So you see, his mind was all messed up. His thinking was all messed up. Job 2, 7, I just want to remind you, so went Satan, this is a review from last week, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boil. Who did it? Satan did it, from the sole of his foot unto his crown, praise the Lord. Job 27, 1 through 6, <clears throat> moreover, Job continued his parable and said, as God liveth who had taken away my judgment. Oh, he's not being fair with me. And the Almighty who hath vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Let's hold it right there. I'm not speaking anything wrong. I'm not thinking anything wrong, Job says. And I'm not going to do anything wrong because if I did, it would justify you, God, in the way that you are mistreating me and not being fair with me. Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. Job is saying his integrity is more, he has integrity and God does not. Is this the person that you want to learn your theology from? No, it is not. Not until chapter 42. Praise the Lord. Let's keep going. Oh, now that was the next one, Job 33, 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back to, here's Job. I'm going to finish that quote off. My righteousness, he's saying, I hold fast. 
and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. He's saying his righteousness exceeds that of God's. Okay, I don't want to hold on to my righteousness because the Bible says that our righteousness is that of used minstrel rags. I want the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Job 33, 1. Wherefore, Job, I pray. Okay, now here's Elihu hit the scene. God still loved Job, wanted to straighten out his thinking, sent one of his anointed guys who knows the truth to speak into his life. And he said, Wherefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches and hearken to all my words. He's trying to bless him. Praise the Lord. Job 33, 8 through 12. But you have said in my hearing, I heard the very words. He's given a recap to Job what he said. Job has said, I am pure. I have done no wrong. I am clean and free from sin. Yet God has found fault with me. He considers me his enemy. Are we the enemy of God? Or is the devil the enemy, enemy of God? Praise the Lord. We're going to go through verse 12. He fastens my feet in shackles. He keeps close watch on all my paths. But I tell you, in this you are not right. Elihu is telling Job, you're not right, for God is greater than any mortal. Next one, Job 34, 5 through 12. Job says, as more of this, I'm innocent, but God denies me justice. Although I am right, I am considered a liar. Although I am guiltless, his arrow inflicts an incurable wound. It's the devil that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Is there anyone like Job who drinks scorn like water? Now, this is Elihu telling him, he keeps company with evildoers. He associates with the wicked. For he says, there is no profit in trying to please God. So listen to me, you men of understanding. Now here's Elihu setting them straight. Far be it from God to do evil, from the Almighty to do wrong. He repays everyone for what they have done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. The curse causeless shall not come. If you believe wrong, you speak wrong over and over again, it's going to come and it's not God's fault. He's given you a free will. <clears throat> We are to use that free will to bring in the presence and therefore the protection and the blessing of God. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. Hallelujah. Somebody with some wisdom came upon the scene. Praise the Lord. Next is Job 35, 1 and 2. Elihu spake moreover and said, okay, he's still talking. He's talking to Job, thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidest, my righteousness is more than God's? Job, do you think that could be right? Then 35, 16. Therefore, doth Job open his mouth in vain, he multiplied words without knowledge. That's his problem. He didn't have any knowledge of what God was really like. Then Job 37, 23, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. Again, this is Elihu speaking. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice, he will not afflict. God will not afflict you. You know why? We're his body. When you afflict your body, it affects you, doesn't it? God said when they were afflicted, I was afflicted because we're his body. He will not afflict. Now, he may put you in a situation that you might be a little uncomfortable in because it's time for you to grow, grow up a little bit, but that's a whole lot different than to afflict you. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, let's go to the next, Job 38, 1 through 4. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Now, God, he didn't listen to Elihu. The devil sent some friends that were just as messed up as Job. 
and they made it worse for him by what they said. Then God sent Elihu, Job didn't listen to him. And God loved him so much, he showed up personally to talk to Job because he didn't give up on him. He wanted his love and his fellowship. This is the kind of God that we serve. And then in verse two, he said to Job, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Uh-oh. I think Job is starting to sweat right about now when God says, I'm so, who is this saying all this wrong stuff? Hallelujah. Verse three, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Who I would one want to be in Job's shoes, amen? I'd rather just be telling God the truth, saying you're a good, you're always for me. I put myself in your hands. I believe in your promise. I'm declaring it and I'm gonna do everything I can in the natural then I'm gonna leave the rest up to you. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. You know, there's two times, there's only two times you praise the Lord, when you feel like it and when you don't, praise God. And then God said, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Hmm, Job, if you're so smart and you know all this, where were you when I made the world? Did you have a part in that or not? What do you think your righteousness is that next to mine? Hallelujah. Job 40, one through eight. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contended with the Almighty instruct him? Job, are you instructing me? Are you telling me what to do and how to do it when I'm the one that made the whole universe? It will keep, go, keep it, go back. He that reproveth God. Job really was reproving, I'm righteous, you're not. You better, you're the one that needs to change God, not me. I'm not doing anything wrong. Let him answer it. God's got him on the carpet, but in his love, it's, you know, he's, he's got to change. Then Job answered the Lord and said, he finally figured it out. Verse four, behold, I am vile. He finally saw his righteousness compared to the righteousness of God. And just as Isaiah did when he saw that, he, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Job said, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I can't answer thee. Here's what he should have done. I will lay my, don't be so fast. I will lay my hand upon my mouth. You know, he'd have been a whole lot better off instead of saying, though he slay me, yet will I trust him just to say like that. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Verse six, then answer the Lord, unto Job out of the whirlwind. Okay, the Lord heard him say what he said. Now, verse seven, God says, gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Verse eight, will thou also disannul my judgment? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Keep that on there. See, this is why we... We just hit the reason why people are going around falsely accusing God, especially preachers, because they have to have an answer for everything. Would it be too much to say, you know, I don't know? And here's what I do know, what the scriptures say, even though I can't answer everything perfectly, you know, some secret things belong to the Lord. And so since they can't say, I don't know, and it can't be their fault, it's gotta be God's fault. So they disannul the judgment of God, condemn God so that they can be righteous. That's why God is falsely accused. I don't want my righteousness. You know, people come down for prayer. I believe God. If you're sick, I'm going to lay hands on you. You're going to recover. Why? I'm a believer, right? But it's not me. I couldn't heal a fly, much less a person. But I can believe God, not in my righteousness. If it's based on mine, well, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I guess I can just recommend a good doctor or something. But 
We don't want to condemn God so we can be righteous. Praise the Lord. Let's see where we're at. Okay. Job, oh, finally, Job 42, chapter 42, last chapter in the book. Praise the Lord. It took him a while, but because of the mercy of God, uh, his great love, he kept working with Job. Just think what he'll do with you and me if we honor him, seek his face, tell him how good he is, say, Lord, help me see your character and your goodness and your faithfulness that I could be like you. Help me, give me the revelation. I'm believing you for it. Just think what he could do with us if what he could do with Job after Job trashed him for 41 chapters. 42, then Job answered the Lord and said, he finally got with it. I know that thou canst do everything and no thought can be withholding from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? He's talking about himself. He said, therefore, have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me. Job saying, I didn't know what I was talking about. He's finally catching on, which I knew not. Praise the Lord. Okay, verse 5 and 10. He says, my ears have heard of you. And let's keep this on there for a minute. But now my eyes have seen you. See, everybody that accuses God of what the devil is doing, well, God's case, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be. God's in charge of everything. Therefore, if this thing bad happened, God must have done it. No, he's given us a free will. People are making bad decisions. There's a devil loose in the world. There's flesh people making bad decisions. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We have the promises of God. We can get into the arms of God, the secret place of the most high God, and even be protected from that. The only time we run into trouble is when we leave that, praise the Lord. But the people that accuse God, they've heard about God from someone, but they don't know him personally. He said, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He now knows what God is really like. Therefore, he says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You think that's going to work out good? I think it is. What happens when we repent from God? That's just saying, he was saying, God, you're wrong and I'm right. Now he's saying, God, I'm wrong and you're right. And the Lord said these things to Job. He said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends. These are the friends that were feeding Job a bunch of guard, uh, garbage. Keep going. Because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Job spoke the wrong thing for 41 chapters and the moment Job repents and says, God, you're right then God says, he, he's not looking at 41 chapters of terrible behavior. He says, Job, I've seen those two good moves, praise the Lord. And he says, you're speaking right about me and all that other stuff is gone. Praise the Lord, keep going. Because we're going to verse 10. So now, and he told those other guys, they have to, take bulls and rams and make a sacrifice. And he said, my servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Praise the Lord. Do you see the heart of God? Job repents says the right thing, and that's what God sees. And, and, and Job doesn't have to do uh, a list of penance and all these things. No, God's going to use him right away as a minister to stand in the gap for others and says he's speaking the right words. Listen to him. Praise the Lord. Let's keep going. So Eliphaz the Timonite and his other friends did what the Lord told them and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Verse 10, 
After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Why? Because he made God his source. It was the devil that came in and stole it. But when he turned to God, believed God, now he can believe God for more than what he did before because now he knows not just what he heard, but he knows God personally and what he is like. Then verse 12 through 17, that's the end of the chapter, end of the book. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 donkeys. Keep going. He also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karin Hapuk. Nowhere in all the land where they're found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died an old man and full of years. Praise the Lord. The world and religion wants to focus on a very short period of time where Job went through trouble that he caused by not believing God, being afraid, thinking about that fear continually and speaking it continually, which meant a break in the hedge. And the Bible says where there's a break in the hedge, a serpent will bite you. And that's what happened. But then they don't focus on the part that he finally saw God for what he was really like, turned things around, and had the great blessings of God in every way for 140 years and dying in total peace and in total health and then went on to be with the Lord. Hallelujah. This is what God will do for you. And do you notice, think about this, the only thing that changed, he was the same person living in the same place. He had the same wife. He had the same family. Everything was the same except one thing, the way he thought about God. Can you see, Job went from the figurative outhouse to the penthouse by just changing the way he thought about God. He no longer accused God of what was wrong or what was bad he turned to God as his source he recognized the goodness of God don't you think since Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever in no respect of persons if we will see God the way that he really is he's a good God that's for you and not against you and tell him so and then believe it and act like it that our fortunes would change the same, praise the Lord. We'd be blessed to be a blessing. People would see the joy of the Lord upon our life. They would see the abundance. They would see the hell. They would see the miracles and they would say, I want what you have. And you say, well, I'm getting it from my God who is good, who is for me. He's in me. He's with me. He's for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? He protects me from everything and the troubles that are in this world. He doesn't take me out of the trouble. He brings me through them with victory. And I grow more and more and become to know more and more about his goodness. For the Lord, he is good and his mercy endureth forever, praise the Lord. That's the only thing that changed. And I believe that God loves this message that I just preached as much as any there is because it'll have the most impact on your life other than how to be born again, that there is. If you're born again, you need to hear this and then just go with it. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You, you know, in fact, most of the scholars wouldn't be in agreement with this, amen? Most of the scholars have to unlearn about a third of what they learn if they really wanna go on to serve God and fulfill their kingdom destiny. So why don't you just go ahead and lay hold of it, walk in it, understand God's good, even if you don't know everything. 
You don't understand it. You don't have to understand everything, praise the Lord. There's plenty that you do understand that you can work with and then just keep learning. But every time information comes in about God, you weigh it against the book of Job taught rightly divided, praise the Lord. And then you say, does it, and if any way it invalidates the goodness of God, you just let that roll off your back and say, no, I don't want that. I don't want to get in the position of Job. I don't even want to move there that much. And so the book of Job is not in the Bible to see how much a man can take. No, it's in the Bible to teach us a couple of things. Here's what Job did and got him in big time trouble. Here's what Job did that brought him out of trouble and into blessing. He was afraid and afraid of what God would do and that got him in trouble. But then when he had faith that God was good, then that brought him tremendous blessing. Hallelujah. In every area of his life, family, uh, possessions, peace, joy, all that, enjoying his family. I tell you, it is fun. You say, well, Pastor David, how, you know, you deal with people's problems and, you know, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and all that. It's fun. Why? Because I don't have to have all the answers. Praise the Lord. I can even say, you know, I don't know. But here's what I do know. God is good. God is for you. Let's find a problem in the word, a, a promise in the word of God because there's not any situation, not any problem, uh, not any snare, not any sickness. There's not anything that you can face that there's not a promise in the word of God to bring you victory. And we just focus on the promise. We believe it. We speak it. And then we see the supernatural take place, the miracle working resurrection power of God. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead can take you from boils all over your body to perfect health and all the children and grandchildren and blessings and abundance and all those things, hallelujah. This is the plan of God for you. Well, Pastor David, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe I know he'll do that, you know, for Billy Graham and everything, but because, you know, I'm sure he's been obedient, but, you know, I, I did all these uh, stinking rotten, you know, things. Well, uh, Job didn't have the greatest track record here. We just, he went 41 chapters of trashing God. But then when he just said, I was wrong and repented and began to trust God and praise God, knowing that God was good, look what happened. And I know you can do that. Then all that other stuff will follow. Once you know God's good and he's for you and he's not trying to trick you or put you into a trap or take things away. No, it's not the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. It's the Lord give it, then give it more. Hallelujah. So you can give more to other people around you. And the more you give, the more you receive and so on. And things get better and better and better. You can do that. Just believe that God is good. And then act accordingly and trust him. Put yourself in his hands. Oh, I'm worried about my kids. What if they, this is what started with Job. I don't see them uh, with the uh, acting godly and doing these things that I'm dreaming for to see them serving God and so forth. Well, just put them in the hands of God. Find a promise in the word of God. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from that. And then just believe God. Say, God, you're good. You're, you want that more than I do. I'm in agreement with you. And I'm going to see it happen with my own eyes. For God, you are good. Hallelujah. And your mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord. Well, that's all I've got. Hallelujah. So God's good. He's always good. He doesn't take a day off from being good. In fact, I'll close with this scripture, James 1:17. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God will not turn off his goodness, not even a shadow of a turn. 
You can trust him completely. It's the greatest place to be in the world, in the universe, is in the arms of God, trusting him completely. And if he doesn't come through, you're toast. But you can rest in the fact that he is faithful. The only reason why we have any faithfulness is because we're made in the image of God. So it's fun to live that way. And if you've never tried it, I encourage you to do so. You, it will be a whole lot different than what you think.